Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Webinar Wednesday. I am very, very excited today because I have one of my most favorite people ever, uh, Roger Wambault. Roger, thank you so much for being with me today. And so for those of you that do not know, Roger is the, one of the senior trainers at Corel Draw. Um, and how long have you been with Corel? I'll be 26 years next month. Wow, okay, okay, very nice. So, and every time we have a webinar together, I always learn something new, always. So I'm very, very excited for you to be here. And um, I'm very excited about Corel Draw 2021. Um, I know uh, you kind of got, I wouldn't say got on to me, but um, I have not yet installed 2021 and I will have to do it after this webinar because I'm sure you will want to. It, absolutely, 100%. So, um, but without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, uh, please wow us with all of your beautiful knowledge. Okay, Roger? Great, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for that great introduction. I'm going to uh, just uh, stop my video to uh, re re uh, <coughs> avoid any problems with bandwidth and whatnot. And let me just uh, share my screen. Now you can see my screen all right? Yes. Yes, we can. So, perfect. So move the window around here. All right. So, uh, well, welcome to the session. Uh, we're going to take a look at Curl Draw Graphics Suite 2021. And uh, this is basically an introduction. I'll be showing some of the new features in the app as well as some of the older stuff. I'm going to start off with what's included with the, uh, the package. Of course, you have the curl draw itself, which is a vector manipulation application. With that is included the curl draw dot app. And so you have access to the curl draw app. The curl draw dot app is mainly for those that have a subscription model, but we currently have uh, this in effect for all those that have curl draw. As a result of COVID, we want you to be able to stay connected uh, with the application. And crawldraw.app is a web-based browser, or sorry, a web browser-based application that allows you to share and view and edit CurlDraw files. Uh, PhotoPaint 2021 is the raster manipulation application, so editing bitmaps and that sort of thing. And then, of course, PowerTrace built into the application allows you to convert from a raster file format to a vector file format. Corel Capture uh, allows you to do screen capturing. And then finally, the Corel Font Manager. Now, the application is uh, Windows 10 64-bit only. Uh, it is also available on the Macintosh. I'll talk a little bit about the Mac uh, and some of the differences as we go along. And uh, at the end, of course, we're going to have a section, a section where we can ask some questions and whatnot. So the interface uh, hasn't really changed all that much. We have a couple of new dockers, which you'll, you'll be seeing. Uh, but for now, I mean, it's the standard drop down menus across the top. We have the standard toolbar below that. Below that, we have the context sensitive or interactive property bar. Now, this property bar is going to change depending on the tools that you have selected on the left hand side. And this, of course, is the toolbox. Any tool that has a triangle in the bottom right-hand corner, that's an indication that there's additional tools buried down below that. Along the bottom, we have page navigation. And I can either go forward one, back one, to the end, uh, or click on a, a tab. Below that is my status bar. So if I select an element on screen, my status bar will tell me what I have currently selected. Down the right right hand side is the standard color palette based on the document settings so for example if i create a new document and in here i dictate that i want a primary color mode to be rgb then my new document will have an rgb color palette down the right hand side to the left of that we have our dockers on the macintosh they're referred to as inspectors you can access those from the windows menu down to dockers alternatively you can click on this little plus this is a, a a quick customize if i click on this plus i'll have access to all of my dockers in here this quick customize is also available uh, up here where i can add uh, additional tools within the uh, the uh, property bar i also have it in the toolbox where i can turn on and off tools that i either need or that i don't need and make the, the uh, 
interface that much cleaner, that much uh, more, more refined, if you will. Next, we have the welcome book. And I'm just going to click onto the welcome book. Um, the only difference in here really is that we've done a rebranding of the Get More. It's now called Store. Uh, you can still get the same information from here, the same files and that sort of thing. Uh, we have the ability to filter. So if I'm looking for various plugins, maybe I'm looking for some fonts, I can select those. I also have something called free. So anything that's included free of charge. So when you get the application, it of course comes with a number of fonts, clip art images and that sort of thing. You can access those from within here. And it's simply a matter of clicking on it and then I'll click on download. I'll go to the back. If I select my library, this is going to show me what I've already downloaded on my system. Uh, if I need to reinstall uh, the application, I do have the ability to go to the help menu and go down to restore purchases. And that will automatically re-download all the content that, uh, that I had previously downloaded. There's also other things in here, such as what's new. And in here, you can learn what's new in this feature. Things such as perspective drawing, which we'll take a look at a little bit later on, the multi-page view, and a number of other things in here. Uh, there's also, just an FYI, there's a survey that's in uh, 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 underway right now. This is until the 16th of June, 10 chances to win $200 in, uh, in uh, Amazon gift cards uh, for simply uh, replying to the survey. Now, one of the new features that we've added in uh, uh, Quilldraw 2021 is the multi-page view. And so when I go new document, you'll notice in here, I have the ability to select page view. I can go single page or I can do multi-page view. Uh, if I'm doing a multi-page document, it'll allow me to view all pages uh, at the same time, similar to the old page sorter view, which is now gone, uh, but I'll show you the, the multi-page view shortly. I'm just gonna create new, or I'm sorry, rather click OK for this. I want to use this new document in a moment. One of the other features that we have is called auto fit. And so if you're creating a multi-page document or you're creating documents where you need various page sizes, I'm gonna select this element here, these elements, I'll copy it. And I'm just going to go into here and I'll paste that in. So I've got a new document. Uh, the document size or the object size is 4.817. Uh, I don't want to have to go in and modify my page size to match that. So we now have something called auto fit. I'll click on this. I can auto fit page. I can also set a margin. So I'm gonna set a margin of uh, 0.25. So give it a quarter inch margin and then simply click on auto fit. It's now created a page size that matches the document or the object that I'm gonna start to work on. So it's a great way to quickly adjust the page size you need. Uh, next is the pages docker. So when we're dealing with multi-pages, uh, we'll need a docker to do that, or as I say, Macintosh, it's an inspector. From the Windows menu, go down to dockers, and then to pages. In here, I have a couple of different views. So I've got a single page view, which is what I'm at right now. I can select multi-page view, and I'm just going to use my scroll wheel on the mouse to zoom out. And so here I can see my multi-pages, I'm showing eight across. If I click on this icon, this will allow me to set the number of columns. So I'll drop that down to five. I can also set spacing in here. I'm holding my roller ball down on the, straight down on the mouse. That uh, puts me into the pan tool and then I'll just reduce that. One of the nice things about this is I can select elements within a page and actually move them over to other pages within the document. So I don't really have to go in, cut and paste and whatnot. I can move objects around. If I select the um, page number or page name of the, uh, of the actual page, that then gives me the ability to move these pages around. I can reorder them. I can also reorder them through the objects docker, or I'm sorry, through the pages docker uh, in here. One other view we have in here is I can go for uh, horizontal, uh, I can go for vertical, I can also do custom. So with custom selected, I can move these pages around, 
can place them in any order. If I have a different page size in here, then you'll see that smaller page size or whatever the case may be. I'm just going to go back to my um, single page view. I'm going to do a, a Shift F4 to zoom to that page. And actually, I've moved ahead quite a bit. So let me go back to my Pages Docker, pick up where we left off. And now, another new feature, and this is uh, something that's been asked for for some time. Um, Sprite, I'm getting a little bit of a feedback, or are these questions I'm being asked, or what? Um, so far, uh, no, we don't have any questions so okay. far. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, get those questions coming in, and we can have a bunch when we get to the end of the session. Um, so, uh, multi-page and file I.O., they go basically go hand in hand. Uh, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about file I.O., and here's a little trick. If I go to Tools, uh, down to Global, so we've changed this around. If you're on an older version, such as 2018, uh, you'll see that this has changed quite a bit. It used to be tools, options, and then you'd open up a whole laundry list of features to select from. We've now tailored that down quite a bit and put them into various categories. So I'm going to go to tools, options, and global. Now, let's say the bulk of your work, you're always bringing in, oh, I don't know, let's say SVG files or PNG files. We can select file formats in here, and I can come down here, I can locate the PNG, and then I can move this up. If I keep clicking on move this up, it's going to bring that to the top of the list. And maybe I should have grabbed something a little bit closer to the top, but this is fine. We now have PNG at the top of the list. So if I click OK on this, I now want to import an image. I'm, I can do a file, uh, a, a file down to import. I can do a control I. I like to use the button bar across here. So I'm simply going to click on import. And you'll notice that when I go to import, my very first one on the list is PNG. So you can actually reorder all of these filters in here and uh, sort of speed up your productivity. Now let's take a look at multi export. So in here, I've got four images that I've created. It's actually clip art images. I'm going to go to my objects docker. It used to be called object manager. And in here, you'll notice that I've take, taken these images and I've actually given them names. If I go into windows, down to dockers, and then I'm going to go to export. This is going to open up the export docker. I'm going to select this image of the Alamo and I'll click on this icon. That's going to add a new item for me in this Docker. So here, what it's going to do is it's going to allow me to export this as a JPEG image. Let's say I also want a copy of this as a PNG. I'm going to select this icon. I can click on Duplicate. And I can select this and PNG. So now when I go to export this out, it will give me two copies of this file. One is a PNG and one is a JPEG. For this image here, I want to add it. I'll click the icon down here. Here, I want this as a PDF. And I want to add another asset with these settings. And I can change the JPEG. If I click on the settings gear, I can go into the actual export options. I can set resolution in here, whether I want transparency, that sort of stuff. Uh, of course, JPEG doesn't support transparency, but if that was a PNG, I can make it transparent. I can go through and select whichever ones I want. I've selected the uh, St. Petersburg. I want that as a PDF as well. So add asset with these settings. It's now added St. Petersburg as a PDF file and we'll uh, grab these arches and I will add that as a PDF file. I'm happy with that. I've got all my files set up. Maybe I'm creating icons. I need, I need an SVG and a PNG file format, or maybe I'm creating some PDF files to send off to a customer, but I also want to create JPEGs to put on my web page. Then I can certainly do that. It's a matter of clicking on export all I'm going to browse to where I want these. 
and I'm going to just go into the multi export filter or folder rather select folder and now what it's doing is it's going through and it's exporting all these files in one shot so it's a great time saver to to be able to take your images and send them out if I now go into that folder and it's opened on my other monitor let me just drag this across and I go into the multi export folder in here, these are the files that I just exported. So I have uh, Alamo as a PNG, as a JPEG, my Greek ruins as a JPEG, and of course the PDF files as well. So it's a great time saver with this multi-export option. Um, next, we have templates. We've added a number of new templates to the application. And of course, as you're probably well aware, uh, Condi has literally thousands and thousands of templates uh, in CorelDRAW format, and we're able to open those up and make use of them. Another nice thing is once you've opened up a Condi template in CorelDRAW, you can then save it as a CorelDRAW template. So when you go File New, and I go New from Template, I can select my templates, and I'll be able to find all the Condi templates that I've saved out there, whether it be for a baby bib or, or a, uh, one of these, uh, these acrylic um, bent acrylic pieces there's a name for it i don't know what it is <laughs> but i think you know what i'm talking about so in here i can go down to um uh, my templates and i can find all the templates that i've created in there and then just pick up and use any one of them I want to show a few interactive tools. Um, I'm not sure if uh, how many people have, have been fairly current with the application. We've added a new shadow tool or a drop shadow tool to the application. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these uh, different tools to show you how they work. These are the interactive tools. I'm going to first off, I'm going to do a right click and I'm going to deselect this or I'm going to select it again rather, which will deselect it. And now I'm going to select my interactive tools and I can actually pull this toolbar right out. So the first one I want to show is the blend tool. Blend allows you to uh, blend from one object to another. That can be from a square to a rectangle. It can be using, you can be using pieces of text or even curves. Uh, I do a straight line, I can blend from one to another. Up here, I have the ability to set the number of steps. I can uh, adjust the, the blending, uh, the, the frequency of the blending in here as well. When we create an object or, or a, um, an effect like this, there's always a control object involved. And uh, in a case of blend, there's actually two control objects. If I select the blend and I click on this yellow rectangle, you'll notice my status bar says control, control rectangle on layer one. It shows me the color. I can go ahead and I can change the color. Let me go back to the yellow. Here's another little uh, handy tip. Hold the control key down and I can click on any color, and it's going to add 10% of that color to whatever I have selected. If I took this ellipse, or this rectangle rather, I can grab my uh, shape tool, change the corners on that. I can take this ellipse here and uh, distort it, do any number of things. Because they're control objects, it's going to affect the way that blend looks and reacts. Next we have is the contour. Of course, Contour allows you to create steps to the outside or to the inside. I'm going to do a Shift F2 to zoom into this. Click on the Contour tool, and then I'll simply click and drag. I should make it the outside. And so you can see I have a 0.1 inch um, contour to the outside, a single step. I, of course, can make this smaller. I can also go multiple steps. Uh, anybody who does embroidery, if you're looking to do an applique, this is a great way to start off with your applique. And you can then take this element, tap my spacebar, returns me to the pick tool, and I can go to the objects menu down to break apart. And I now have these as, as separate objects that I can play around with. Uh, Shift F4 to zoom back out to my page. The envelope tool, I'm sure you've used the envelope tool, I'll be showing a little bit later on with another effect or another uh, uh, feature sort of thing. Envelope tool, simply a matter of clicking it 
and I can pull these nodes out and create a curvature of the text. Sometimes if you want a nice smooth arc, delete this node and then pull it out. It gives you a smoother arc. Of course, I can do the same to the bottom. Extruding text is fairly straightforward. Click on the text or the extrude tool. I'm going to click on my text. Just zoom into that. With the um, extrusion, I can add colors for shadow and that sort of thing. Let me go to this one. So we have that extruded. Let's go down to a yellow. I can change the vanishing point, do a number of different things to this. I can also change the lighting uh, so I can add lights to it, uh, allow the shadows and the highlights and that sort of thing. Let's take a look at the shadow tool. I mentioned there's a new, a new uh, drop shadow tool. So first off, we're going to select the shadow tool. It's the first icon in the effects toolbar. And it's a matter of clicking and dragging. And we've all seen this. It's been in Corel Draw uh, since Corel Draw 6. Uh, I can pull the drop shadow off. I can change the color of the drop shadow by dragging a color on there. I can also change it by going to the uh, interactive property bar at the top and adding, uh, adjusting the drop shadow there. The next one is an inside drop shadow. So my drop shadow tool has a new one, a new uh, cousin on a new brother, I guess, on the property bar. I'm going to select this. I'll select this element and I'm just gonna click and drag. <coughs> Excuse me. And so now I've created a drop shadow and it's given the effect that this is now three dimensional because it's actually a drop shadow on the inside of this object. If I grab the drop shadow tool, I can play around with this and I've now set it to the end, uh, the, change the offset of that. And it now makes it look as though this is actually cut out of the object in behind. So that's the, that's the new, new uh, drop shadow tool we have. I need to, um, a second here, mute my microphone for a second. Sorry about that. Um, the next shadow we have is the block shadow and the block shadow was introduced in 2019. So I'll tap my space bar to return me to the pick tool. And remember, tapping space bar will toggle back and forth between the pick tool and the last tool selected. So I'm going to select my block shadow. And it's the very last one right over here. Click on block shadow. I click and drag. And this is typically how we created a, uh, a drop shadow in Corel Draw 6. We uh, duplicated the text, made it a solid black color, then added a Gaussian blur to it. Uh, and uh, that's basically how you created the drop shadow. Now we have the drop shadow tool, but we also have this effect here, which is a block shadow. The block shadow allows me, I can change the color of it. On the interactive property bar at the top, I can set overprint. I have a number of different options here, such as simplify. Uh, I like the simplify, I think that's kind of a neat little effect. I'll click on that, go to my object menu, break it apart, tap my space bar, I'll click off on it, and then I'll just move this piece of text out of the way. So I've created a nice little text effect using the, uh, the block shadow. All right, shift F4, and let's go on to the next page. I've mentioned uh, enveloping. Um, I've used this uh, image before. Maybe I should get a different image, but it's, it's, uh, it's easy enough to explain how the envelope works using this image. I want to do a virtual sample of a coffee mug. So I have the customer's logo, and I'm going to put this onto the mug, and that doesn't look too bad. However, with the envelope tool, I'm going to, first of all, tap my space bar, select the mug, shift F2 to zoom into it, tap my space bar again. It's giving me back the envelope tool. Actually, select the logo. There we go, there's my envelope tool. I mentioned that uh, you can get a nice smooth curvature by deleting this node. I'll delete both of these nodes. And now I'm going to move this line. I'm going to try and match the curvature of the bottom of the mug and the curvature of the top of the mug. 
Now, that makes it look a little bit more realistic um, that, um, with the ability of adding the envelope to that. A perspective was has been around for, for some time, uh, particularly with text and vector elements. Recently, I think it was 2019, we've added the uh, uh, perspective effect to bitmap images as well. So I can take this image and I'm just going to zoom in. I use my scroll wheel on the mouse. Put this into position. So if anybody does sign making or if you want to, uh, uh, maybe you want to, maybe you have a photograph of a uh, picture frame on a mantle and you want to take a, a photograph of the, the customer sent you and stick it into that frame and make it look as though it's actually in the frame that you can send back to them, uh, again, to make a virtual sample or something like that, then it's certainly quite doable. From the effects in the objects menu down to perspective, and then add perspective. And it's simply a matter of moving these corner nodes into position. So it's giving the illusion that this uh, image is on the actual billboard itself. It's as easy as that. And of course, same thing here. Um, I'm going to select this, go to object, perspective, add perspective. Probably should have moved that in place first. And now it looks like this sandwich board outside the uh, the coffee shop is is uh, all ready to uh, invite customers into the uh, into the establishment. And it looks like I'm missing an image here, so I'm not going to show this. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what happened with the file. I guess I forgot to include an image here. Not to worry. Oh, there it is. It worked in rehearsal. Uh, this actually should be titled Transparency. Um, I'm going to take this element and drag and drop this onto here. Now, we can create transparencies with solid objects or uh, bitmaps as well. And uh, there's also lenses, which is a little bit different. I'm going to take this element, I'll grab my transparency tool and click and drag. It's very easy to create a, uh, a, a completely different image with, with uh, just the two bitmaps. Close off. I am missing a page. Oh, I see what happened. This image should have been on this page. So let me just delete this and I'll show you the next feature, which is perspective drawing. This is a new feature in 2022, uh, or sorry, 2021. And it gives you the ability to draw in perspective. So if I go to my objects menu, down to perspective, because nothing is selected, I now have the ability to draw in perspective. Up here, you'll notice that I can do a one point perspective, two point, three point worm's eye view or three point bird's eye view. I'm going to select two point. Now I can either tap the space or tap my enter key or I can click and drag and I'll get my perspective view on the page. In here on the property bar, I have the ability to switch to my different views. This is going to allow me to uh, set the uh, horizon opacity I can also set the frequency of perspective lines. I'm going to bring that up to about 80. And I can also change the uh, intensity of the perspective lines as well as the color if I wanted to. So now with the perspective view, I'm going to grab my rectangle tool. I'm going to start with the left and I can click and drag and it will snap to these points. I want to do the right. And then I can do the top. Oops. That didn't work out well, did it? Oh, I know what the issue is here. I'm going to undo a couple steps. I'm going to take the horizon line 
and I'm going to move that up a bit. Now let's try this again. So we'll start with the left. My right. And I'm just doing this very quick. And then the top. And of course I can give these, um, I can turn snapping on, I can give these uh, objects different colors. And I'm just hitting the tab key to cycle through them. And I'll make that yellow, but I want it a little bit darker. In perspective view, or once I've done my perspective view, I also have the ability to import objects. So I'm going to click on my import And let's go into this folder here. I'm going to go into logos and I'll bring in this PNG. So we can add elements to the, um, into our perspective view. And let's just put that onto this panel. Well, I'm not sure what happened there. Ladies and gentlemen, it worked in rehearsal. <laughs> it always does. Yeah, I'm not sure what I've done there. I can't grab that. Okay, that's just wonked. Wonked is a technical term, right, Sprite? I, yes, I believe it's an industry term. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, suffice to say that you can uh, add text, add various elements to your uh, perspective drawing. So this could be a series of buildings, whatever the case may be. Once you're finished creating the perspective, it's just a matter of clicking on the finish, and there you have your, uh, your design. One thing you'll notice is that I cannot, and this was a question we've had a couple of times, I cannot rotate this object. Uh, I cannot rotate a perspective unless I take that perspective and go to object, break perspective group apart, then you have the ability to, uh, to rotate or skew that perspective. Okay, a little bit about uh, text or fonts. Um, <clears throat> we've added support for variable fonts in uh, Corel Raw 2020. And of course, this spreads to the Macintosh as well. And of course, you can take any of the, the PC fonts and put them on your Mac if they're open type fonts and whatnot. A variable font, for those who are not aware, gives me the ability to add various uh, characteristics to the font itself. So I'm going to do a Shift F2 to zoom into this. And <clears throat> if I'm using a variable font, on my interactive property bar, I'll select this icon here. And this is going to open up the panel. Most fonts, most variable fonts that I've seen do not have as many variables as, as this particular one does. It's usually two or three. So I can make it a bold font. I can just slide, change it to a slab font. And as I move this, you'll see what's happening with the font itself. I can increase the weight of it. I can even uh, go with rounded, for example, and do adjust the font this way. If you've done that to a font, you've done you've uh, changed the number of the different variables and whatnot. You need to uh, to do another piece of text. It's easy enough to simply grab that particular font, and of course, I can right click and then copy all properties. And this now is taken on the same properties as the, uh, the original text did. So very, very powerful in dealing with variable fonts. A uh, Corel Font Manager, although it's not new, uh, it's still a very powerful tool. And one of my favorite features of it is the ability to use fonts that are not installed on your system. I'm going to uh, tap my Windows key and I'll just type in Corel Font Manager, and we'll let this launch. Now, we've made an enhancement to the Corel Font Manager for 2021. 
uh, and it, it's huge. The if you've ever used the font manager, you know that you can create sets uh, or collections. They're they're referred to. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I'll show you how to do that right now as soon as we, we launch this. But in 2021, we now have the ability to export those collections out. So if you need to uh, reinstall the application, or maybe you have two designers in the shop, uh, both running CorelDRAW 2021, you've gone through, you've created your collection. Uh, here's my collections in here. I'm just going to move this down a bit. So you can see I have a number of different collections here. These are my chalk fonts. I've got some decorative fonts. I've got some engraving fonts, uh, poster fonts, and that sort of thing. I can go file down to export folders and collections. And I usually recommend just ex give the export file format, file name, the date. So we've got 060921 and I'll click on save. It's as simple as that. I've now exported all of these collections out. To create a collection, uh, first of all, let's start start with the libraries or the the folders. We call them watched folders. Uh, any folder in here is a watched folder. By default, uh, there is a folder called fonts and it's located in your documents folder. In the Corel folder, Corel content, and it's in here called fonts. That by default is your is where you keep your fonts. Now I've got um, I've got a, a, another folder down here, large font collection. That's over fifty thousand fonts in there. I'm not going to go ahead and select that one, but I have about ten thousand fonts that are currently. I'm going to use the term active, uh, in that I can access them through the Corel Font Manager. Uh, any font that has a yellow band on the right hand side is an indication that font is not installed. Any one with a green band means the font has been installed. If I want to install this font, it's simply a matter of right clicking on it, I can select install and it's going to go ahead and install that font for me. You'll notice that the bar is going to change to a green bar. If I want to take uh, one of these fonts and add them to one of the collections, I can certainly do that. Back in Corel Draw, I can select a piece of text. And for my font drop down, I have a filter. Now these, these filters have been available since Corel Draw X8. I can select my filter and I can say, well, I want to take a look at the font in my chalk collection. And so now it's only going to show me the fonts that are in the chalk collection. I'll deselect that. I'm going to scooch down a bit, another technical term. I'll select not installed. I now have access to any one of my fonts that are not installed in Windows, and I can make use of those. I can set various filters up here for licensing. I want to use a font that is, I'm free to share with, um, then I can certainly filter that way. Okay, power clip. Uh, it's an old feature. It's been around for a long time. Just a couple, a couple of quick little keyboard shortcuts. I'm going to right click and drag. Let the mouse button go and power clip inside. Hold the control key down and click on my power clip container and I can reposition this. Control click outside and it finishes off the power clip. I've shown this little feature um, in the past, uh, if you're doing sublimation on, say, ceramic tiles and you want to create a backsplash or a mural for a restaurant, in my toolbox, under the polygon tool, I have graph paper tool. Now, this particular image is, uh, let me grab it with the pick tool, is four by six. So, with the graph paper tool, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this 12 by 8. And now I can create a grid with the graph paper tool. Right click and drag, power clip inside, and I can click on fit contents, fill proportionately, and that has now filled that up. I can right click and remove the outline. I can also ungroup. And so now I can take these images or these objects, lay them out 
print them onto my sublimating paper and go ahead and sublimate those on a ceramic tile and then rebuild the tile at the restaurant or wherever I want to put up this thing. So it takes a few seconds to create something like this and uh, you might see a, a good uh, good investment or a good return on, on uh, a little project of this nature. Power trace, I uh, talked a little bit of power trace. I'm, I'm sure most are familiar with that. Uh, I'm going to select this element on the interactive property bar. I'm going to click on trace bitmap. I'll select clip art and it's very quickly going to trace this for me. And one thing you'll notice is that uh, trace, we have redone that quite a bit. A lot of people feel that it's gone very slow. Um, and that is because previously, if the bitmap image was of a certain size, we would automatically reduce it. And we found that sometimes that would uh, degrade the quality or not be de as desirable. So we no longer automatically reduce the bitmap. As such, we're dealing with larger files, so it does take a little bit more time. Now, I've told it to remove the background color. If there's anybody that does uh, screen printing or vinyl cutting, clicking on the color tab, here I have the ability to come in here and I can grab a, uh, a Pantone palette and that will automatically convert all my colors to spot colors. I also have the ability to select these colors. They're very similar. So I'm just going to merge those. Maybe this blue and this blue, I can merge that merge these ones. So as you can see, very quickly I'm able to reduce the number of colors. Try it again. Select that, this one, and merge. And now one other setting is on the settings tab, group by color. That's an important one to select as well. I'll click OK. Here I have the ability of, let me just delete the background. Here I have the ability of ungrouping this and now I have all my blues as one group, so I can send those to the cutter if I'm cutting on blue vinyl. I'm cutting on orange vinyl, I can send all my orange objects. So it's a great way to uh, quickly create that file that you need. Um, one other thing is, and I'm gonna watch my time, there's, uh, let me see where I am on this. Um, okay, life is good. Um, so on this bitmap, questions I've seen in the past is how can I create a hairline outline around the perimeter of this? Well, of course, you can grab the freehand tool and I can click and drag all the way around the perimeter. I find it much easier to do a trace on it. I'm going to select clip art. I want to make sure that I delete the background. I do not want to remove the image uh, once it's traced. One more thing I mentioned about the speed. You'll notice down here I have an estimate time. Once it reaches that time, then over here I have the progress, and that shows us making progress on that. I'm going to go to my colors tab, and I'm going to drop this right down, maybe two or three colors. And then I'm going to simply click OK. With this object selected from the objects menu down to shaping and to boundary, I'm going to right click on my red and I'll make that a little heavier just so you can see it. And you can see that I've actually added a red outline around the perimeter. I'm gonna hold the alt key down and I'll click here. My alt key is my digger tool and it's actually dug down one level. I had too much selected, let me do that again. Hold the alt key down and delete. And so it's deleted the traced version. It's kept my bitmap for me. And I now have a cut line. Obviously, you'd want a narrower cut line if you're going to cut that on a laser or something like that. But uh, just, I did it wider just to show you. So it's now easily created a cut line. This is a new feature that we've added in 2020. I'll leave it there, in 2020. Uh, and that is the upsampling. Prior to this, we had photo zoom, which was a one of the best kept secrets uh, in, as part of photo paint, it will allow me to upsample an image. So a customer says to you, I want my logo on a coffee mug. And you ask him for the logo, he says, well, you're gonna have to go to my website. We know that's a 72 DPI image and probably not a very good quality. So a little trick or a little tip is, is to take that image, upsample it, and then trace it. 
and you'll get a much better result. Upsampling has greatly improved in Corel Draw. We no longer use the photo zoom. In fact, we no longer ship with that particular plugin. If you're using something prior to 2021, then of course you can use photo zoom. From the bitmap menu, go down to resample. And I'm going to increase this to 2000%. And I'll click OK. You'll see how quick it's going to do that for me. There's my image. Remember the Alt key is my digger tool. So I'll hold the Alt key down. I want to click right here. I've now selected a copy of this image that was on top of the other, that was behind the other one. I'm going to bring this to the front. So this is my original image. And this is the resize. So you can see my original image down here. And this is how that's resized. Great, uh, great results in upsampling bitmaps. I can now take this out. This is 140 inches across, so it's huge. I'm going to delete that, zoom back to my page. Um, pointalizer, I kind of like this little effect. Uh, it used to be an extension in CorelDRAW X8. Uh, we got rid of extensions and we started to include them in the application in the various menus. Pointalizer allows me to create a sort of a, let's call it a pseudo halftone pattern. So from the effects menu down to Pointalizer, it's going to open up a docker. Now I should point out that CurlDraw in the Macintosh does not use VBA, and as such, Pointalizer is not available. Uh, CurlDraw in the Macintosh uses JavaScript. So any of the scripts you have in CurlDraw windows are not available on the Macintosh, such as a calendar creator, uh, color palette, uh, color swatch creator, and that sort of thing. They're not available on the Macintosh, but um, certainly they are available on, on the Windows system. In here, I'm going to set this to 15. And just very quickly, I'm going to click Apply. It's going to use a circular shape to create a pattern for me. I can zoom in, you can see that it's very quickly done that. This is still, this was a raster image. This is now, these are now vector objects in here. And you can see it's a group of 16 objects. Actually, if I ungroup all. Uh, okay, so it's created patches, right? It's probably done it by colors. Yeah, it did, 16 colors. Let me just undo that. I don't want to limit colors. Apply. And now it's done it again, um, but we're, we're over 9,000 objects in that. I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And here's a fun little one. I'm going to take this and I want to add the, uh, do the pointalizer effect on this. So I'm going to do a custom shape. I'll select this element here. I'll click on select. And now selecting this image, I can click apply. It's going through and it's applying that effect. I should probably, or I could probably have dropped that down to 16 colors and it would have been uh, equally effective. But we now have a, uh, a sort of faux cross stitch pattern that you could sublimate onto a, a towel or something like that. The final slide I have here is, uh, or second last slide, is workspace customization. Anybody that has sat through any of my sessions know, know that uh, my favorite feature in the entire application is customization. The ability to work smarter, not harder. You've seen me go back and forth from pe uh, pe previous page to next page. I'm doing that by tapping the number one on the keyboard, number two. So number one goes back, number two is forward. My thought is this, if I can keep my left hand on the keyboard, and my right hand on the mouse, I can be a lot more productive. I don't want to have to uh, take my hand off the mouse to hit page up, page down, or swing my left hand across to hit page up, page down. My hand is on the keyboard, one and two will send me back and forth. Go to Tools, Options, Customization. And in here, I'm going to change a couple of other, custom, uh, couple of other keyboard shortcuts. And this is how easy it is. I want to go into the view menu and I use wireframe a lot. So I'm going to scooch down to the bottom. I'll select wireframe. There currently is no keyboard shortcut for that. I'm going to use the letter W and I'll click assign. To get out of wireframe, I want to go back to enhanced view and 
I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut Q. Easy way to remember that is on a quit wireframe, I'll click assign. So remember, I said, my left hand is on the keyboard. I go into wireframe, out of wireframe, forward page, wireframe, quit wireframe, go back a page, all without moving my hand that, that much. So it's a great time saver. Other things you can do with respects to customization that's very quick and very easy. Uh, you do contouring a lot. So in the interactive property, or sorry, in the uh, um, in these, this property bar, the effects tools, I do contour. I'm going to hold the control plus alt key down. I'll drag this onto the page. I also do fit text to path a lot. Let me just put this over here. So I'm going to go to my text menu, down to fit text to path, control plus alt. I'll click and drag, and I'll bring this out onto the page. I'm now starting to build my own custom toolbar. As far as customization goes on the Macintosh, it's somewhat limited. Uh, 2021, we now give the user the ability to create keyboard shortcuts. So customize your keyboard shortcuts. You cannot export your um, your keyboard shortcut list. So if you have to reset the defaults, you have to re, uh, re, uh, redo those shortcuts. So And there's no way of sharing keyboard shortcuts from one system to another. Uh, there are some minimal changes that you can make to the toolbar at the top. And uh, that's about it as far as the Macintosh goes. The final slide I want to talk about is the Discovery Center. And that's a uh, Discovery Center is set up where we have all sorts of tutorials, both uh, written and video. And uh, you can access that. Uh, any browser, I'm just going to open up a browser window here. I'll drag this over. And it's learn.corel.com. And on the Discovery Center, we have contests up here. We have free stuff. There's scripts, there's uh, templates, all sorts of stuff like that that you have access to. Under the tutorials, if you want graphics tutorials, simply click on that. And there's all kinds of uh, tutorials that are available. What's new in CorelDRAW 2021? All sorts of information in here that helps you uh, better understand the application and learn some of the ins and outs. And Sprite, that's what I've got. Roger, that was fantastic. I always learn so very much from you. And I do have a couple of questions. Sure. Before, before we get to that, if I may just say one thing. You say you always learn a lot from me, and I really appreciate that. I want to show you something that I learned yesterday for the first time. Now, you've heard me talk about wireframe. In the objects menu, first of all, to get into wireframe, it's view down to wireframe and enhanced. You can color the various layers. This I've known for a long time so that I'm in wireframe. I know what objects are on what layer. But I learned this yesterday. Control click on a color. I can now put that particular layer in wireframe. So my entire design is not in wireframe, just that one layer. That's a new thing I learned yesterday. I thought it was kind of cool. Continue, sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, show me that again. Sure. If I have a, and let me go into here. So this is a new document and I'm gonna change my wireframe color. I'm going to make it red and I'm going to add a new layer and I'll make that one um, blue. And now if I grab, if I create some elements on this page, let me move that out of the way. I've got a rectangle. I'll give it a, it doesn't really matter what color it is. I'll do another object um, here. If I go into wireframe, because this layer, layer one is, is the red and layer two is, what is that, black? Blue. I made that a blue, let's go lighter blue. View wireframe. You'll notice that these objects are different colors based on, actually, I didn't put them on the layers, did I? These objects are different colors based on the layer that they're on. So if you're doing a floor plan where you've got mul or a file where you have multiple layers, you can go into wireframe and you can see the different layers quite easily in their various colors. I want to get out of wireframe and now with the control key, I can click on 
this, and that puts just that layer in wireframe. The other two layer, the other layers will not be in wireframe. You know, I was I was trying to do a two three color vinyl yesterday, and it had been so long since I had done something like that in Corel. And if I would have known this yesterday, that would have saved me so much time. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great little tip, great little tip. I'm actually compiling a list of tips right now. I think I've, I've got about 55 of them done up so far. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Mean, Even after yeah. all these years, we still learn stuff. Absolutely. It's, a, it's just an awesome app. 26 years and I just learned this now. <laughs> You have some questions, uh, Sprite. I do. So does the Learning Center have a search option? Great question. I don't know. Mm. I believe it does. Yes. OK. And if somebody wanted to take a class on Corel, how could they do that? Uh, another awesome question. We currently don't offer classes. Uh, we're actually just starting to very, very preliminary discussion to bring back the training uh, training uh, program or training t team. Um, most of the training I do is is this type of stuff, webinars or, or trade shows and whatnot. Um, from time to time, I'll get a customer or a company saying, look, at, we want you to do, a, uh, do some training. I can certainly set stuff like that up. Um, just reach out to me and, and let me know what your needs are and we can we can go from there. Uh, my email address is roger.wombolt at corel.com and just mention Condi. Roger.wombolt, that's W-A-M-B-O-L-T at Condi. I mean, I, not Condi, at corel.com. At corel.com. <laughs> yes. And mention Condi so I know that uh, you're on the session. Okay. Um, I had a question from the very beginning when you were talking about the export tool. When you yes. were exporting as multiple formats, can yep. you um, can you name the objects? Uh, absolutely, and that's what that's what you need to do actually. So if I was to export this image here in my object Docker, it's called rectangle. So when I export that, that's going to be exported as rectangle. <clears throat> Let me get out a wireframe. Oh, this layer is in wireframe. No. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened there. That's interesting. I'm going to save this file. I'm going to look at that later on. Uh, so in the object Docker, uh, I've, I've named this Greek ruin as opposed to group of 75 objects. And so when I save the file name out, that's where it picks up the name from. Um, if I added this, for example, in the multi-page in the multi-page uh, uh, export, you'll see it has because it's ungrouped. It's added all of these elements. So you would typically want to group this first and then add it. But whatever name you assign that group is what the name of the file will be. Great question. And do you just right click on the, the group and rename from there? Um, easiest way with that group selected from my object Docker. This is it here. I'm just going to right click. Rename. And I'm going to call this uh, chart. And now if I go into my export, I've got a lot in there. I should, um, let me just uh, export that. And here it is right here. So it's now called chart. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, yes, 100%. Um, I have a lot of people asking if this is going to be available for replay, and yes, absolutely, it will be on our both our Facebook and our YouTube pages. Um, a lot of people saying they need to set some shortcuts, and um, and okay, so Jerry Jerry Dyke, one of my most favorite customers, she has a really good question. She uh, when I we, remember Jerry, I think <laughs> it's hard not to know Jerry. Um, <laughs> 
when when we were when you were doing the perspective um, she asked what would I use to size text from eight eight inches by 3.1 inches to 3.1 inches by 0.4 inches and keep the text in perspective Wow uh, now let's let's okay so step one step back okay um, when you're talking perspective are you talking using the perspective tool or drawing in perspective I think she was talking about using the perspective tool how do you change the size of it that's a great question I have no idea I, I, I do want to say that drawing in perspective is amazing that's the first time I've seen that and that was really really neat really really neat Well, you see, your size, no, I don't think you can, simply because your size is dependent on the bounding box itself. Right. Although, I suppose if you were to, if you're able to calculate the percentage of difference, Let's say it was 40% small. I don't remember what the numbers were, but let's say your second uh, set of numbers was smaller, and let's say it's 40% smaller, possibly typing in 40% in here. No, see, that didn't, that didn't uh, maintain perspective. I don't think you can. Okay. So I have a, um, a lot of people are very, very excited. Um, a lot of people are uh, telling me that they have downloaded the trial. Um, I, you guys, I, you should know, uh, we do have Corel 2021 available on our site. And Roger, you will be at our open house. Well, not at our open house, but participating in open house. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, you, you'll be seeing some of the stuff I've shown already today, but uh, my session is, uh, is quite a bit longer. I think it's a 90-minute session. Good, I love your 90 minute sessions. And everybody will be able to chat with you in real time and you will be able to read the questions. And so it'll be, it'll be really, really good. Um, well, Roger, I wanna thank you again uh, and thank you all for watching and um, stay cool out there, Roger. <laughs> yeah? Yes. All right, guys, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much.